The Peter Schiff Show. Well, another week and another round of bad economic news. Uh, Maybe Wall Street is finally starting to pay attention, but I'm still not sure the message has sunk in. But let me go over some of the economic news that came out this week. We did get the JOLTS report on Tuesday. And what this does is it measures the number of job openings available. And the consensus was for 5.158 million which would be a slight improvement on the 5.133 million from February. Excuse me, this is, a, this is a March number, so we're still looking at the first quarter. Well, instead of the 5.158 million, the number was 4.994 million. That was way below even the lowest uh, end of the range of what people had been expected. So we got a much you know, weaker or not quite as strong report on the number of jobs that are available. That was yesterday. But the bigger economic news that really sent the dollar tanking and gold surging back above 1,200, up about 20, 25 dollars an ounce, was the news that we got on retail sales. Now, of course, this is retail sales for April. And everybody was looking for a strong number, right? Because after all, nobody could shop in March because it was just too cold outside. You know, people were like, oh, it's too cold. I'm not going to the mall. But then April came along and Wall Street thought everybody was going to be saying, oh, what a relief. I can finally get to the shopping center and buy all this stuff that I've wanted all winter. But I just couldn't drive down to that mall because it was just too darn cold. I I really didn't want to walk from the car you know, in the parking lot to the door of that mall because that walk was just going to be so frigid. I just didn't want to do it. I, I've been I've been held up in my in my condo here all winter like a bear in hibernation, dying to buy stuff, but I just couldn't do it. And now, you know, it's April, the flowers are out, the springtime is here, right? We're going to go shopping. This is what everybody thought was going to happen. Well, it turns out that the um, the consensus of a 0.2% rise in, in retail sales didn't make it. Instead, retail sales were flat in April. Worse yet, ex-automobiles, uh, they were looking for an increase of 0.5. We got just 0.1, 0.1, right? 80% less than what they were looking for. And if you take out not only uh, cars, but gasoline, They were looking for an increase of 0.4. Instead, we got an increase of just 0.2. But really beneath the surface, you had a collapse in retail sales in really all categories except groceries. People spent more on groceries, not because they're eating more, uh, but because groceries are more expensive. But this is the fourth time in five months that retail sales have risen less than expected. On a year-over-year basis, the increase is 0.9. That's over an entire year. That is the weakest increase in year-over-year retail sales since 2009. And department store sales, they really got clobbered. It was the biggest drop in department store sales since January of 2014. And remember, there was a lot of snow January 2014, right? That was, you know, the beginning of the polar vortex. But this is the biggest drop uh, in department store sales since then. Even consumer electronic sales went down. You know, what is amazing to me is not that this number was weak, but that Wall Street wasn't expecting it, right? I mean, how could they expect debt-laden consumers who just have part-time jobs, who are dealing with a rising cost of living in basic necessities, how do they expect these individuals to keep on shopping? You see, if they bothered to look beneath the headlines of the jobs numbers, right, like we talked about on the last podcast, they would know that these jobs are no good, that it's part-time jobs for senior citizens. That's who's getting jobs. It's 60 and 70-year-olds, and they're not going to take their money to the shopping center and buy stuff. I mean, these are older people. They don't need stuff. What they need is to pay their rent, to pay their electric bills to pay their medical bills. That's why they're working these lousy part-time jobs. They're not taking that money to department stores. See, the younger people who would be buying clothes and things like that, they can't get jobs, 
right? That's what the data shows. In fact, one uh, thing I didn't even point out on the podcast on Friday is this birth death model, right? The birth death model added 175,000 jobs to the um, to the total. It was like 230,000 or some odd jobs that were created. 175,000 of them were from the birth death. And again, what is that? That is where the government just makes up jobs because they assume that a certain number of companies were created in the month and that those companies that they assume were created, they also assume they hired people. But what if these companies were never created? What if it's just the imagination of the government statisticians? And remember, these guys are biased, right? If you think the economy is strong, you'll assume that businesses are being started up. And then you'll assume that those startups are hiring people. And you build that assumption into the numbers. But now, of course, Wall Street looks at those numbers and says, oh, look at the strong job creation. We have a strong economy. It's a self-perpetuating spiral. Just people thinking it's strong makes it strong because it biases the numbers. The, the jobs are there because people think they're there. And then when Wall Street sees the jobs that the government assumes were created, they say, you see, the economy is strong. And it just feeds on itself. But it's all one big lie. And of course, at some point, they're going to have to come back and they're going to have to revise down uh, all of these months of job creation because the jobs weren't created. That's why there's no spending. You can't spend uh, an imaginary paycheck, right? It's, you know, so these jobs aren't really being created. And that's why there's no spending associated with them because there's no paycheck. So there's no spending. But the jobs can be made up. But the retail sales data can't because you have to actually spend the money. They don't assume it was spent. They actually count what was what was really spent. And so Wall Street is, is always surprised because, you know, the economic data is weak. And they say, well, how can the economic data be weak when we have all these jobs? We don't have all these jobs. That's the problem. And the jobs we have are low paying. And when you have a low paying job, you don't spend a lot of money because you barely earn any money after you finish paying for food and and uh, and stuff like that. And then, of course, you know, you've got people, you know, loaded up on, on debt, you know, credit card debt or, or student loans. I mean, that's why, you know, so many kids are in school now, right? Because they, they know they can't get jobs, so they stay in school and they go and get a master's degree, even though the guys with, uh, you know, uh, regular degrees are waiting tables or, or driving cabs, right? What's the point of getting a degree when the people that already have degrees are doing, you know, minimum wage type jobs? And I think a lot of people... You know, they stay in school because they can't get a job. So they figure, well, let me get a master's degree. Maybe I'll hope the economy gets better and I'll spend a couple more years in school and take on some more debt. But then I think you have a lot of kids or people that don't even want the education but need the loans. You know, if you can't borrow money because you're broke and you don't have a job, how are you going to survive? Enroll in college. That's how you survive. Just enroll and now you can borrow all sorts of money, no questions asked. You know, once you're a student, you know, you've got government guaranteed credit. So you can go borrow whatever you want. That's what's going on. And people don't realize that. Now, we also got business inventories. This is a big number, right? This was for March. So we're still backward looking into the um, first quarter. And March business inventories were only up 0.1, right? They were supposed to rise by 0.2%. Instead, they rose by 0.1%. There are some people that were looking for it to rise as high as a half, you know, so way below that. And making it worse, they took the February increase of 0.3 and they revised that down to just 0.2. So both these numbers factor into the GDP for the first quarter. And it's now my guesstimate that based on all the bad numbers that have come out since the original estimate of Q1 GDP, in particular, that horrific trade deficit. But we've had a lot of other bad uh, news that has come out since the trade deficit. I think there's a good chance that the GDP is going to end up contracting by greater than 1% in the first quarter. Something like, you know, 1% to 2% negative in the first quarter. Now, what about the second quarter? Because everybody is still hopeful about the second quarter. Meanwhile, all the April data that we've gotten so far, I think, has been bad. And in fact, the Atlanta Fed GDP now today just revised down their estimate for second quarter GDP to 0.7. And they're the ones that were very close. They, they were within one-tenth of a percent of guessing Q1, although now after they revise it, you know, they're not going to be as close. 
But 0.7, that would mean if they're accurate at 0.7 and we end up getting a first quarter of minus one or more, that means the U.S. economy will have contracted for the first half of the year. And yet the Fed is still looking for, what, 3% economic growth, which would mean we need to get 6% or something like that for the second half of the year. There's not a snowball's chance in hell that that actually is going to happen. In fact, what's more likely is that we get a negative number again for Q2, right? We could have the second quarter GDP actually contract. And if we get a contraction in the second quarter, which follows a contraction in the first quarter, that's an official recession. That would mean the U.S. government, U.S. economy rather, is in recession for the first half of 2015. Now, if that is the case, and that very well may be the case, how is the Fed going to raise interest rates in June? I mean, when we're in a recession or September? Not a chance. What are they going to do if we're in a recession? More QE. Because what can they do? Nothing. They can't lower interest rates because they're still at zero from the last recession, right? That is the box that the Fed is in, right? They, 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 they created a situation where just talking about raising interest rates, even though you leave them at zero, just talking about raising them is enough to push the economy into recession. But I don't think it's just the talk about rate hikes that's done it. I think it's the ending of QE or the pausing of QE3. I think because they took away that punch bowl, the party ended. Except nobody noticed everybody leaving that, you know, you know, going out the back door. But that's exactly what happened. And I said that. I said that initially when the Fed was tapering. I said if they keep tapering, if they end this QE, we are going to have another recession. And if we have another recession, the Fed's going to have to ramp QE back up again because that's the only thing they can do. But imagine how bad this recession is going to be when the Fed can't raise rates to stimulate the economy, when the only trick they have up their sleeves, right, is QE, QE4, which is what's coming. And when that happens, right, the moves that we saw today in the foreign exchange markets and in the precious metals markets are going to look very tame by comparison. But meanwhile, the dollar has already broken its uptrend. In fact, look at Europe. You know, Europe is growing faster than the United States. They've been coming out with their GDP numbers, and they're growing much faster. All the negativity that you had on Europe, except for Greece, uh, which is in recession, and maybe the United States, the rest of the Eurozone, uh, as bad as things are over there, you know, they're doing better than we are over here. And Great Britain, of course, is doing better than, than Europe as a whole. You know, that was, a, you know, um, uh, Krugman was very critical of, of Britain. Oh, you guys are doomed because, you know, you didn't do enough stimulus, right? Well, you know, he was accusing them of doing austerity. And while I think it was a far cry from austerity, what Great Britain did was far less reckless than what we did. They actually had some reductions in government. And as a result, the British economy, British economy is doing better, better than the U.S. economy and better than Europe in general, not worse. So Krugman is going to have to eat these words, although I'm pretty sure when we go back into recession, he's still not going to admit that he's wrong. He's going to say, you know what? I told you guys we needed a bigger stimulus. You know, it reminds me of uh, from Jaws. You know, we need a bigger boat. You know, hey, we got to go back. We need bigger stimulus. You know, we need a bigger round of QE. And I think, and I said this before, what we're going to get next is not just QE. Right. We're going to get old fashioned Keynesian pump priming stimulus. There's going to be big deficit spending uh, because Congress, you know, everybody is posturing. Right. Nobody wants to stand in the way of a potential recovery. But people are going to say, look, the Fed can't do it all. They might say the problem with the stimulus is, you know, we were we, we were operating with one hand tied behind our backs. You know, we were doing monetary policy, but not fiscal policy because we had this irrational Republican objection to deficit spending. And what we need is more. Stim we need double barrel stimulus. We need, you know, to fire on all cylinders. Right. We need the monetary stimulus and the fiscal stimulus combined for the super stimulus. Right. This is what we're going to get, which means the budget deficit is going to blow out of control. Right. Well through a trillion dollars. We're going to have a big round of quantitative easing. And is that going to give us any economic growth? Not a chance. Right. Because the last three rounds of QE didn't give us any economic growth and neither will these. Will they blow more air back into the stock market bubble or the housing bubble? Or maybe, maybe. But the air is going to come out of the dollar bubble quicker. Right. Which means even if you own U.S. stocks or U.S. bonds, or U.S. real estate, you're going to be losing money because the dollar is going to tank. And that, I think, is going to be the big trade. It's like the subprime trade 
of, of, of this year where you have everybody loaded up on what is, in fact, a subprime currency. Uh, they think they got something that's AAA rated, like the people who are holding on to all these mortgages. And they woke up and they found that they had nothing. Right. They had a worthless piece of paper. And that's what the U.S. dollar is. You've got so many people who have bought into this myth about, hey, the strong U.S. economy, we're going to be raising rates and we're on the doorstep of recession. And again, what's that that's going to prove to people is it doesn't work. Because if we go from recession to supposed recovery back to recession and the Fed has never raised rates, they simply talked about doing it but never got around to it. And now we're back in recession and now they're ramping up the QE all over again. Where is the Fed's balance sheet going to be at the end of QE4? It's four and a half trillion right now. Where is it going to be? Seven trillion? Eight trillion? Who knows? And when it gets that big, is there anybody on the planet that's going to believe Janet Yellen when she says that she's going to shrink the balance sheet? How could she possibly do it? If she couldn't shrink it from four and a half billion, how is she going to shrink it from seven or eight billion? And our creditors are going to get wise and there's going to be a run on the dollar. And you can just see the beginnings of it today. You know, with the euro now back around 113 and a half, the dollar was down across the board. Big move up. The Australian dollar now above 81 cents. I think this is the first time it's been this high since early January. And, you know, gold back about, you know, 1215 Every time it gets to this level, every time it kind of gets smashed down, you know, gets back down below 1200 1180 1185 you know, and there's big buyers that come in that have been loading up. I don't know who the shorts are or the sellers are. I think they're speculative shorts, but at some point they're going to have to give up, right? They're, all this economic data is going to have to sink in. People are going to start to recognize it's not the weather. Because if the economic data is bad in April, then it's not the weather, right? Because the April weather was fine. It's great shopping weather in April, right? The, the best, right? And so if people aren't shopping in April, they're not shopping, right? And if it wasn't the weather in April, then it wasn't the weather in January or February either or March. And now all of a sudden, everybody has to say, wait a minute, we ignored all that bad news because we thought it was the weather and we thought it was temporary. But now we have to go back and react to that news because it wasn't the weather. And then the, um, Janet, Yellen, Janet Yellen is still blaming the weakness in Q1 on the weather. Right. That's why the Fed hasn't changed its economic forecast uh, for the second quarter or for the entirety of the year. But once this bad news comes out, they're going to have to come back and admit that it wasn't the weather, that they overestimated the strength of the U.S. economy. It's going to be a lot weaker than we thought. And then it's game over. Right. They now they've showed their hand whether they come right out and say what well, we're going to do QE4. They might not do it right away. But what else can they do? Right. Because if they don't do it, then it's an admission that the last three rounds of QE didn't work, which they're never going to do since they're so convinced and so insistent that it worked. They're obviously going to do it again. Hello, this is Peter Schiff. I bet you didn't know that without silver, you wouldn't be hearing this podcast right now or be able to use a computer at all. From laptops to smartphones to TVs to speakers, virtually all modern electronics use silver to conduct electricity. Did you know that the average solar panel uses two-thirds of an ounce of silver to function? And the solar industry is expanding dramatically, not just in America, but in booming developing nations like China and India. Silver is naturally antibacterial and is used extensively in modern medicine. Silver coatings are being added to breathing tubes, bandages, catheters, and other medical instruments to reduce the spread of infections. When antibiotics fail, silver still works. I believe the 21st century will be the century of silver. As fiat currencies continue to collapse and new uses are found for silver every day, the white metal strong industrial demand and low per ounce price will make it increasingly attractive to savers around the world. At today's prices, people of any age and background can afford to buy some silver. Learn why silver is a smart and reliable investment in my free special report, The Powerful Case for Silver. Visit shiftsilver.com and download it now. The Powerful Case for Silver includes information about silver's amazing chemical properties. It also explains why I believe silver may outperform gold in the coming years. Download The Powerful Case for Silver and educate yourself, your friends, and your family about the white metal. Just visit shiftsilver.com to download my free report. That's shiftsilver.com.